everyone, and welcome to First Mining Gold's Live Investment Summit today, hosted by SIX. I'm pleased to introduce the CEO and Director of First Mining Gold, Dan Wilton. And with us today as well is our guest, President, CEO, and Director of Big Ridge Gold, Mike Bandrowski. Mike is going to walk us through a presentation of his, and after we'll be taking questions live. Remember that you can submit your questions using the Q&A panel found on the right-hand side of your screen at any point during today's presentation. And as always, this event is being recorded, and it'll be available to watch on SIX.com in the coming days. Without further ado, Dan, I'm going to hand things over to you to get us started. Cam, thanks very much, and thanks to everyone for joining us. Uh, it's been a while since we've been able to connect here, um, and I think you know, we look, I'm, I'm looking up here at the at the title of this, the the Hidden Value series, and I think it's one of the things uh, that kind of struck us a few months ago. Is uh, and it was actually just after a conversation I had with Mike uh, in the spring that there is so much going on inside the companies in our partnership portfolio that um, uh, we really kind of need to find a forum to be able to let our shareholders, you know, uh, sort of engage directly uh, and hear about a lot of the great work that's going on that, you know, we think goes to support that hundred million dollars of value that's not our main project sitting in uh, in first mining. So I'm delighted to have uh, Mike Bandrowski joining us today. Um, you know, uh, the, the deal where Big Ridge, um, uh, optioned into, uh, Hope Brook was, you know, largely as a result of, uh, Mike's vision and persistence. So, um, we've had a chance to, you know, spend a lot of time together over the, over the last couple of years as this has all come together. And, uh, uh Mike, I think, uh, if we can, I'll, Turn it over to you, and uh, from our standpoint and perspective of uh, of sort of the attendees here, great to just get an update on where you are. Maybe give a little bit of the the background on how we got here, um, and then an update on where we are with uh, with Big Ridge, and we'll kind of I think just jump back and forth here. Yeah, thanks a lot, Dan. Thanks for having having me today. Um, yeah, I guess it was a bit of persistence, um, <laughs> certainly. Uh, a couple years worth, but um, you know we uh, we were attracted to the project and uh, and we're glad to be spending money on it right now and advancing it forward. Um, so yeah, welcome to uh, to Big Ridge Gold. Uh, just by way of background, the the company has been around like many juniors for for quite some time. It was formed in uh, 1984 um, as Alto Ventures, uh, but um, I, I got involved in late 2019. Uh, the board at the time was a bit tired and uh, they were looking for new leadership. So uh, in 2020, we ended up um, closing a, a business combination and uh, rolling the stock back and recapitalizing it, um, and which resulted in uh, changing the name to Big Ridge Gold Corp. Um, we completed that uh, in July of 2020 and then um, uh, I guess almost 12 months later, we were able to announce uh, an earn-in agreement with First Mining on the Hope for Gold project. So our, um, uh, you know, outside of Rick Major, uh, who was with Alto, uh, we've um, completely revamped the board. Uh, myself, uh, I've spent, you know, plus 15 years in the capital markets based out of Toronto, uh, covering precious metal and, uh, and base metal stocks on the, uh, on the research side. Uh, Nick Tintor uh, also joined us uh, shortly after the name change. Um, Nick and I were actually, uh, both of us were, were pestering Dan for um, the better part of a year and a half to, uh, to try and get the Hope for Gold project out of him. Um, and uh, Nick actually has quite a bit of experience in Newfoundland. He um, put into production the Pine Cove mine, which is still um, today uh, in operation. Um, it's Anacondas, or now Signal Gold, I believe is the new name. Uh, we brought in Christina Bates this year. Um, she came in to chair our audit committee. Uh, Christina is also from uh, the South Side, uh, worked at um, a, a few um, investment banks in Toronto on the, on the sales desk, uh, doing a lot of mining work over the years. Uh, Bill Williams, uh, Boston-based economic geologist uh, that uh, he uh, he joined us with a ton of experience on the uh, exploration side, operations and permitting, um, working with Detour Gold and Orvana and um, and most recently with Western Copper and Gold. Um, Rick Major, another uh, 
geologist with um, a lot of Toronto Venture Exchange uh, experience. He's involved with many um, juniors right now. And then James Maxwell, who was um, uh, put on uh, put on the board for um, the placement for First Mining, who joined us this year. Um, so myself, President, CEO, and Director, uh, Jim Kirks, our CFO, who has um, also got vast uh, Newfoundland experience. He spent over a decade with uh, Marathon Gold before joining us. Um, Bill McGinty is our latest um, addition. He joined us in January as our VP Exploration. Uh, Bill has, um, you know, vast amount of knowledge. He's been a huge addition to the team, um, working with uh, East Main and Queenston Mining as two notable names. And then on our advisory side, we've got uh, Lori Curtis and Bill Pearson. And um, just uh, I want to highlight Bill Pearson actually um ran and operated coastal gold for five years which their primary primary asset was the hope gold project uh before being acquired by first mining in 2015. yeah it's it's funny mike going back uh prior to my joining first mining when i was uh i was a partner at a mining focused private equity fund um when bill was was trying to raise money in it just before the the first mining acquisition and it came in um Justin Reed, who's now the CEO of Troilus, was involved with Coastal as well as a director. Um, so that was kind of my real first exposure to Hope Brook, but that would have been probably, you know, 2013 or 2014 as they were still kind of trying to pull it together. I always thought it was super interesting even at that time, but it's it's great to, to that you guys have been able to bring some of that continuity back because I think Bill is the one person who knows the most about this deposit in the world probably. Oh, 100%. And he's uh, fully passionate about it and speaks of grandeur about uh, the potential here. <laughs> Fantastic. So uh, we are uh, Canadian focused. Um, you know, we're, we're obviously um, spending the most of our time in Newfoundland right now on the Hope Gold Project. But uh, we do have a few other can uh, gold projects across uh, Canada. One, we've got a 36,000 hectare land package in Manitoba. Uh, last drilled by Noranda in the late 1980s. And we've got um, uh, another project called Destiny that's just northeast of Valdor with um, a little over 600,000 ounces in it. Uh, so we're improving uh, gold mining camps. Um, we're in great jurisdictions. And, uh, you know, the company's in good financial shape right now. At the end of uh, last quarter, we had roughly four and a half million in cash and over a million dollars in, in marketable securities. So Hope Brook, um, you know, it uh, despite not being well known, um, it uh, it did produce for ten years. Uh, they produced around uh, just over seven hundred and fifty thousand ounces. It was put into production by BP Selco. They operated the mine as an open pit and uh, underground operation for five of that ten year period, and then the asset was. Um, or their gold arm was sold off and this asset ended up in uh in the hands of royal oak who produced there for another um another five years um until going uh, into bankruptcy in i believe 1997 uh in which the asset went back to the province and it was reclaimed by the newfoundland government so we are in you know we're obviously in an established mining camp we're in a great jurisdiction uh newfoundland's a fantastic place to be working um you know it's it's uh easy to um get in touch with the local authorities permitting's been fantastic so far um and we've got a great working relationship with them uh we are on the southwest coast and um you know we are somewhat remote as well uh our getting the site is either uh via air or water um, and it, just like it, when it was an operation, they, uh, they brought in their crews, uh, by boat. And, um, so no change there. Uh, there has been some work done on a road, but, um, uh, the, it has not been permitted and is not part of our, uh, near term future plans yet. You don't need a road. You have, uh, you have the world's greatest liquid highway right in front of you like this, the, you know, the, the project is on tidewater, all the infrastructure, like, you know, a. a big pier and a, and a, uh, a kind of roll on roll off barge <clears throat> sort of uh, facility is all right there. So, you know, I think, 
It's it's funny. I didn't appreciate until I joined First Mining and and went to see the project. Um, this I think is still the largest ever producing gold mine in Newfoundland. Would that be a correct statement? Oh, absolutely. Um, like by, think, by an order of magnitude in terms of total ounces. Yeah, four or five times for sure. Yeah, and the other thing is that uh, everyone who has ever worked in mining in Newfoundland in the 90s worked at Hope Brook. And uh, the experience I always had, I'm sure you found the same thing. Um, this is everyone's favorite project. Like people who work there just gushed about about Hope Brook, and it's like a, you know, a, something that was a real success. That's kind of close to the heart of the mining community in Newfoundland. Absolutely, we get CVs weekly, uh, and they're people with experience from working on site. Oh, amazing! Uh, our our consultants work there. Um, you know, some of our, our current uh, team actually used to work at the mine as well. So. It's uh, there's a lot of resources there and a lot of knowledge on the on the asset. You no, know, for sure. Um, so we, as you said, we're yes, we're on tide water, uh, and we've been utilizing that to date. Uh, we barged in all of our equipment, our drill rigs, and um, we've also got a um, 1100 meter airstrip, which is in fantastic condition that we've been using since uh, we started drilling in uh, in November of last year. Um, we bring in our, obviously our crew, food, uh, fuel supplies, um, on a daily basis out of, out of, uh, Stephenville, which is about a 15 to 20 minute flight, depending on the wind. Um, the camp's been significantly upgraded, winterized. So it's, um, you know, it's, we use it 365 days a year and, um, we're still connected to grid power. Uh, and as I mentioned, um, you know, permitting's been uh, been fantastic, and we've been able to get everything in order um, within you know uh, a month to a month and a half. The uh, the resource that we've stated right now is uh, actually from a 2012 um, resource estimate that was put together by Coastal Gold. Uh, so it is based on $1,200 gold. Uh, there's about 400, or sorry, 954,000 ounces there at about 4.7 grams in a three gram cutoff. Um, so it's a great starting point for us. And um, in the, the deposits wide open in, in all directions. And, and that's what we're focusing on right now is, uh, is expanding that and then uh, hopefully moving toward an updated uh, MRE, MRE here in um, late 2022 or early 2023. Um, so as I mentioned, we commenced our phase one drill program. It's 25,000 meters, uh, kind of a three pronged approach where, um, where we've started testing the deposit to the Southwest, uh, closer to the surface. Um, that is pretty much wrapped up now. Uh, and we've released a couple of, oh, I had a couple of press releases on results so far. Um, we're starting to drill a little bit deeper and try and connect the main zone and the 240 zone. Uh, hopefully that will be done in the next uh, 10 to 14 days and then we'll move to the northeast extension which um, you know effectively it, it, you know it's been known but effectively it'll be a, a potentially a new discovery for us um, if it if it comes good um, and so far the thesis is working out uh, you know all the drill holes we put out 100 percent of the drill holes have intersected gold mineralization to date um, and we're proving that uh, the deposit is open to the southwest, and uh, and hopefully, you know, in the next week we'll have an, our next set out to the market. So, Mike, on the on the last point here, where you talk about the copper, um, you know, this was historically it 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 was a low grade of copper, but it produced actually a really good copper concentrate, which isn't always the case. Um, but this was, uh, as I recall, was was a pretty sought after um, good, you know, blending copper con. It was very clean. Um, what what have you guys done, or what can you do to um, understand what the copper grades would be mixed in with the gold in the historic resource? Because even you say here, the past exploration hasn't really quantified it. But are there any things you can do to be able to include, you know, include the copper in this? So that's one of our goals going forward. Um, and the nice thing is copper was sampled in the past. 
Um, and we're continuing to do so now, and we will make it part of our mineral resource estimate when we when we update that, uh, like I said, in the new year or late this year. Uh, so, and to your point, uh, it was a payable con, um, and I, you know, I can't, uh, I don't recall the actual grade. It was, uh, I think, around mid twenties, but it was um, my understanding as well as it was sought after and um, and a great con uh, for the horn. Um, but yeah, we've got some work to do there, but it will be updated in that resource estimate. And, uh, as far as grade, I mean, it's a little early to tell right now, but, um, that copper is, uh, there is a, a high correlation between it and the gold. Um, so it likely will be, um, you know, a payable in the future and, you know, could cover operating costs at, uh, uh, or mining costs or something who, who knows, but, uh, there will be a credit for sure. Uh, if the mine goes back into production. Awesome. So right now, uh, as I mentioned, there's um, uh, that old resource, 2012 resource uh, is highlighted in the red. Um, you know, we've, we've put in some uh, simple schematics here just to kind of show, um, yeah, the deposit is wide open, but where we're, we're drilling right now. So the, the blue lines are, those are results that we've actually released. Um, I think in the next few sets, you'll start to see us move further to the southwest, uh, stepping out further. Uh, post that, uh, as I mentioned, we're, we're uh, trying to connect the 240 and the main zone. And then our last target, uh, as I mentioned, will be to the northeast here. Uh, we haven't, we haven't um, put it in the diagram, but we believe it is an offset uh, to the main zone. Um, and that's been primarily identified through ge geophysics. Uh, there are a couple holes that were drilled there in the past. Uh, one was, uh, or both of them were by Bill Pearson in Coastal Gold. One was right. too far to the west, and the other one uh, actually just came up short of the target, but did have, um, I think, upwards of you know 1.8, 1.9 grams in the, in the last few meters of the hole. So there is smoke there. And uh, we intend to test that uh, hopefully in uh, in early to mid July. So just back to um, the, what we've released so far, um, you know, our first set of drill results were more confirmatory for us. Um, and then we've started to um, fill in a few of these gaps and move to the Southwest. So, uh, as I had mentioned, I think the next few press releases, you'll start to see this area get filled in and then we'll be stepping a little further to the southwest before um, uh, drilling, you know, down three, four or five hundred meters and, and trying to connect the two zones. So, so, so Mike, how are, how, are, how are you guys thinking about the project as open pit versus underground? at this point because that was something that we spent a bit of time looking at and understanding but curious you know you're, you're seeing uh you know gram and a half at 11 meters 33 meters of a gram you know with some higher grades in between there um but all pretty close to surface so you know just curious on on how your thinking is evolving on this yeah and i would note too that's that's within a broader system too um that kind of uh, grades range from 0 0.2, 0 0.3 to gram, gram and a half over um, significant widths. Uh, we're kind of, you know, obviously uh, picking what we put in as our intercepts. But um, I, you know, we haven't defined anything yet as to whether um, we're just underground, just open pit uh, or both. But I think, you know, the discussions we've had so far we would likely envision what was done in the past and that was both um you know no open pit component uh moving to an underground it's just going to depend on um you know what the engineers come up with and how many ounces we have to give up to go from open pit to an underground yep okay So uh, what we've completed and, and what's happening on site so far, um, you know, we updated the the uh, the camp for year round exploration. Uh, we completed a CSAMT geophysics program southwest across the deposit to the northeast. 
Um, and that we're using right now to spot our holes for the, uh, the drilling we're going to do on the Northeast extension. Um, we've, uh, November 3rd, we started that phase one drill program. I think you'll see us wrap that up in early August at this point in time. And, uh, and we should have consistent drill results, uh, out to the market, uh, depending on turnaround time, but likely out toward, um, Halloween and um and regionally uh we've started to um uh, we just finished a geochem program property wide uh you know the consultants identified 42 targets for us but um and they're quite significant i mean many of them dwarf um hope brook but um in reality there's probably six to eight would that look really, really interesting? So we'll get out um, to those uh, in the next month or so and start to prioritize those. And they'll likely become part of the program in 2023. And we'll start talking about the regional play here. I mean, if you look to the west of us, um, there's Matador Mining. And I think they've got two or three deposits as you move a little bit northeast. Uh, Marathon's got four and a half million ounces and three or four deposits. So yep. Um, we really like the the regional play, and and uh, we obviously we like Hopebrook and uh, and the upside there as well. Um, on the sorting front, we started an initial program with Tor to uh, sorry Tomra. Um, there was a successful study done in 2013, uh, and we're just um, basically adding on to that. Uh, their technology has improved, and uh, and we do have mafic dike material in our uh, in our deposit. That if we can, um, you know, if we can. Um, uh, uh you know uh, up the head grade out of the mine to plus five grams i mean it's um it'd be fantastic and uh, and i think they've already shown that they can do that on a small scale we just need to do it on a larger scale uh and then you know key milestones for us uh post the drill program will be uh the resource estimate um and then moving toward a pea and uh, i would imagine this year the way we're moving along, we'll, um, we'll complete our phase one um, earn-in as part of the agreement between First Mining and us. Um, oops, so just a, um, a um, kind of airborne view of, of the camp to give you an idea of what we're looking at. Um, so the we've got the airstrip and the wharf, uh, as mentioned. Um, the white holes are proposed drill holes. Um, the orange is the the, uh, the main zone projected to surface. So as you can see, we're moving to the southwest and towards the 240 there. Um, the yellow highlights that northeast target, which, uh, as I mentioned, will will be um, mobilizing there probably in two weeks from now. We hope. Uh, and then the last thing I'd highlight are the old tailings, which are uh, in the in the red hash marks, and we point those out. Um, you know. Tailings can be a touchy topic at times. Um, we just highlight that um, obviously they're on site because this was a past producer, but uh, they're fully maintained and um, by the, the Newfoundland government. They're not our responsibility. The government comes to site uh, and um, obviously monitors them and you know cleans alders and cleans up the site and just maintain make sure that they're in uh in, in full operation so it's not our responsibility or our liability at this point in time but do you have a sense for what kind of capacity would be remaining in those tailings facilities if you could recommission them um well i guess the first point is um I, i'm not i'm not a a huge proponent of tailings operations, but there, uh, you know, there is a resource on them. So there is, I think, one hundred and thirty thousand ounces of gold in uh, in tails. Um, so that's something that's obviously worth investigating in the future. Um, but as far as um, life, uh, I there there is a, a few years of life left in the tails for sure. Um, I don't recall offhand exactly how many uh, what the capacity is, but there there right. certainly is room. Okay. Um, and, you know, just wanted to highlight on some of these um, regional targets at um, on the Holtbrook site. Um, as I had mentioned, there's there's um, there's a lot of interesting um, 
uh, gold targets on the property. Uh, only a, a few of them were, you know, have previous drilling in them. There's Phillips Brook and, and Cross Gulch that were drilled, I believe, in 1984 and 1986. Um, and have, no one's really ever gone back there to do any work. So that's um, that's part of the um, the the program right now is to start to prioritize these. Um, I know we'll have our team out uh, on these targets over the next month while the the, the weather's good. Um, July, I understand, can be a little bit foggy. Um, we'll roll up our sleeves then on these targets, and then um, hopefully to continue in um, in August and September when uh, when it gets sunny again, and, the, and we can start working on them and, and and bring those into the fold for 2023 as um, as the regional plan. Uh, so our agreement with First Mining, um, our, we had an upfront payment of $500,000 and issued them 11 and a half million shares. Our stage one to 51% is um, over three years. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, I think that um, probably, you know, maybe a year and a half in, um, we'll probably complete that spend and, uh, and be at the 51% mark. Uh, and we'll issue another 15 million shares. Um, a JV is created at that point, and we grant uh, first mining a one and a half percent NSR. And um, uh, and then on to, to stage two, which um, you know is another 10 million dollars in the ground, less uh, a step up to a 10 percent management fee. And, uh, and up to 10 million shares as well when, when uh, we complete that. And then lastly is the two million payment to first mining on commercial production. Um, I guess I'd highlight too, Dan, the, there is another royalty there on the aggregate, um, something that we really haven't, it's a dollar a ton, but we haven't touched on that. But uh, for the listeners, there is um, uh, what um, an in-house resource of several hundred million tons of high quality aggregate there that um, may be uh, of significant value in the future. Absolutely. No, we always thought that was an interesting, an interesting angle of the project here, um, and did did a bit of work on it. So hopefully, at some point, that uh, that dovetails into a development plan. Um, so, and to your point, it's nice to be on tidewater. Yeah, <laughs> when you're mining aggregate, yes, yeah. that's uh, what you call a critical strategic advantage. Being on tidewater and having a power line, right? You didn't you didn't make much of that, Mike, but this. This project has enough power to like run a mill, right? They, <laughs> yeah. they they ran the old mill on that power line, and I was amazed the first time that I went to Hope Brook. We landed in a helicopter, uh, you know, and it it looks and feels like a pretty remote camp. And then you walk into the kitchen and you flip the breaker, and the lights come on. Like it's uh, it's pretty cool that way. So, all right. Um, well, that's, that's, I think, I think that's a great overview. Anything else that you want to cover off before we, uh, before we dive into questions here, we got a few of them piling up. Uh, no, let's, uh, we can certainly move on to uh, Q and A. Yeah. So listen, I, I think, you know, I summarize it, uh, in some of our conversations, um, was probably a little more refurb than you expected going into it. Uh, you know, things were probably a little bit slower to get going to the point where you're generating real news just because, um, you know, ramping it up to a different level of activity needed a bit more infrastructure. But now you're, uh, you're midstream and you're putting out results that, you know, anyone else putting out uh, 10, 20, 30 meters of a, of a gram and a half plus some copper from surface, you think pe people would have... Uh, uh, would have, the share price would have had a bit of a different reaction, um, you know. Uh, so be very curious. There's obviously lots of news coming, and and as we kind of get into the beginning of the of the next resource in the economic studies, I think that's going to be pretty interesting. Yeah, absolutely. We're actually um, just in the midst of um, uh, well, we've been getting RFPs returned to us for uh, for those two milestones for that resource estimate and for that PEA. So um like to um to nail that down soon and get going on it. Fantastic. Well uh in that case why don't we uh why don't we jump a little bit into the Q and A here. Um so if you have any other questions on the Q and A tab uh, feel free to 
to uh, to fire those up in there, and we'll kind of run through them here. So Jeff had asked the question of uh, how many months a year can you drill? You touched on it a little bit that there's there is some uh, you know when it gets foggy, it becomes a lot less reliable. But uh, but you know how many months uh, basically? What are the windows when you can and can't work? We um, I guess I'd say eleven months because drillers like to go home for a month at Christmas. Um, but you know, that being said, we can drill year round. Um, our, we, it, we have to shut down, uh, sporadically for wind storms and, and gales, but, um, you know, they, it's 10 hours, 12 hours, and then we're back at it again. Right. Our biggest issue drilling wise has been, um, uh, we, we had to shut down for a week because of COVID, uh, you know, we sent everyone home. Um, so really, uh, weather rise and, and, um, you know, uh, property wise, you can drill year round. There's just, um, the odd day you lose here and there to weather, which you would anywhere in Canada. Um, and, uh, and the other challenge I guess we face too is, um, you know, you don't want to have, or you need redundancy um either with skidders or bulldozers or whatever because if one goes down you can't just pull up a flatbed tomorrow and and fix it uh it needs to right. go out by barge so we do have to have a bit of redundancy there and how long uh, how long is the barge trip when you're coming in i mean that's there would be a, a few hours but it's you know you're not talking like it's on a barge for days right no 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 it's um they come in in the morning and uh and their best case scenario for them is they, they get in there in the morning and then they're back to Bergio at the end of the day. Um, I mean, obviously weather on the oceans, the, the biggest key there. So, yep. um, but yeah, it's a, it's a turnaround in one day. Oh, that's great. Um, okay. Uh, Ken has asked a question. Um, how quickly can the project be advanced to kind of a construction ready stage? And what do you think the, spend would be to get you to that stage from here um yeah that's um that's an interesting one Big question. It, it, well yeah i mean it's um it, if it's just hope brook um you know maybe by the by the end of our earn in we can be at um you know that that pre-fees level um and starting to think about permitting but um in, uh, for me, in a perfect world, um, I hope uh, we have three or four targets that come good. And, you know, uh, all of a sudden we're looking at, you know, multi-million ounce potential here, um, just like our neighbors to the to the northeast. Um, and, and it's a different ballgame at that point in time. Um, I don't think moving to production is going to be, you know, the, the top of the totem pole. It's going to be, um, you know seeing if this thing's got five, six, seven million ounces in, in a few satellite deposits. Yeah. And I guess you're probably, you know, we're, we're wrapping up a drill program. Now you probably are just kind of starting when you the, the mineral resource estimate, the other work that's kind of coming in from there, but probably starting to scope next year's drill program a little bit later in the year when you're setting budgets. So probably unfair to ask you what the budget's going to be next year. Um, it's certainly not set yet. No. Um, <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, we, we also want to, um, I think this Northeast extension is a big part of our drill program. Uh, I know some of our investors continue to ask about it. Um, in hindsight, maybe I, I should have gone there first. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the low hanging fruit was near surface and, uh, into the Southwest. So that's, that's where we started. Yeah. No, yeah, it's interesting. Okay. Um, uh, Timothy's asked a question. Can you talk about the cost and logistics uh, of extracting this kind of gold from the deposit? So maybe just historically kind of what the what the flow sheet was like at Hope Brook. Um, so it, it went through a few iterations. I guess yeah, they, yeah. They, they did have a they actually had a heap leach for that ran for several years. Um, and then um, they went. I guess BP went to CIL and then uh, when they sold the project, um, Royal Oak put in a concentrator and that's when they started getting paid for the, uh, the copper credit. Yeah. Uh, so a few changes there. And then that last five year period, um, uh, the con was shipped to the horn 
and um, I guess was uh, quite sought after. Yeah, yeah, you know, with an ounce of gold and the copper credit, of course, it's uh, it's a nice <laughs> one, right? And there's, uh, you know, as far as um, uh, the arsenics and and the deleterious elements, I mean, very very low. So it was, you know, it was probably blended with anything. Yeah, yeah, I know it's. Um... Uh, but it wasn't uh, not all the gold went into the copper cone, as I understand. They actually leached it and then or either floated it and then leached it and then sent the the remaining con off, right? So, yeah, yeah. So um, not not atypical for this type of deposit where you'd have where you'd have uh, have um, uh, some copper in it that you'd want to get through flotation. So the good news is it can probably be done a bunch of ways because it's been done a bunch of ways before, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true enough. Yeah, yeah, we you don't have to worry about a uh, a pilot plant cuz it's run for 5 years and produced, you know, hundreds of thousands of ounces of coal. So that's great. Uh Warren has a question when looking at the mine zone and 240 zone is the mineralization the result of different events? Or do you think this uh deposit could be, you know, a larger kind of copper gold uh porphyry style deposit maybe at that at depth what's the what's the bigger picture geological thesis at this point um i yeah it's interesting i we hadn't thought about it as a different event but being high sulfidation i mean it was you know probably formed as a mushroom and then got stretched and squeezed and moved all over the place so um yeah i think to answer the different event right now we're probably thinking not at all um because we're gonna we're gonna try and connect the two um the the question that i have um is why did they drill the 240 but nothing in between yeah um and no one has an answer for me on that uh which is really interesting because you know it sits deeper um and uh, we know there was some drilling done uh in between for a potential decline to get to the 240 but it never hit they never drilled um far enough to get into the zone so that's what we're interested to find out is if it's mineralized between uh the 240 and the main zone at that yeah and that's uh how how deep is the 240 remind me uh it's down to about 450 500 meters the bottom yeah not super deep right like that's Mm -hmm. you know uh, that's that's reasonable decline angle, particularly coming from where the existing underground development is. Oh, exactly. Uh, all right. Um, uh, David's asked the question, are there any labor or supply chain issues that were really challenging in the 2022 season for you guys up there? Uh, 2022, no. Uh, 2021 was a different year, though. Um, <laughs> uh we so our goal was to um to staff up with uh, as many people as possible from newfoundland and um it was um relatively easy to do so we had a lot of people that had interest here tons of cvs coming in for various jobs even stuff we didn't need uh so it was fantastic on that side the challenge we had uh was getting uh, a newfoundland based drill company to site uh we we put out rfps and um they didn't need the work so you can imagine the pricing we got was not very competitive uh so that was the only uh challenge we had we had um you know we had to bring in a crew that uh or not a crew but a company that's based in manitoba um the the funny thing though is is uh once they got going uh we were able to staff up uh the both drill rigs with uh newfoundland base um uh drillers all right so uh as far as travel uh it was pretty easy to get them in and out uh we weren't paying you know to to fly people across across the country which was great um it's just we had to pay um i guess a little bit higher mobilization cost to uh to bring rigs and dozers and and equipment in from uh from uh, winnipeg well that's interesting um yeah, I, I suspect uh, you're competing with some pretty big programs in Newfoundland. I don't know how many rigs Newfound has going or how 14? many they have going at Valentine. It's probably like a similar number, right? So uh, every drill rig that's probably ever been in the province was just soaked up on those two, let alone, you know, Matador and others who are who are doing real work. So 
And the, the, I guess the, uh, the other point I didn't touch on, uh, on that question though, is, um, the biggest bottleneck became, um, Eastern analytical because everyone was sending them samples oh, for assays. Wow. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know what the number was, uh, but I think it was quite large on, uh, on turnaround time. Um, we went with, um, ALS and started out around 12 weeks, but, um, we've, we've got samples back in three and a half to four weeks now. So it's starting to get back to uh, reality, uh, yeah. on the NSA front. Yeah. And I'll say that same with us, uh, with some of the assays that we have going out from spring pool, it's, you know, there, there was a real crunch period, but I think the combination of added capacity and, uh, you know, it's, I don't think it's any more complicated than everyone raised a lot of money in, in 2020 when the gold price spiked. And last year they spent that money drilling and haven't, a lot of companies haven't been able to replenish the treasury to the same degree. So I think you are broadly in the industry seeing drilling slowing down here um, a little bit. Although, you know, you're, you're uh, you're competing with, uh, with those two projects in Newfoundland is the same as... Uh, as first mining competing a little bit with Great Bear, now Kinross and a two hundred thousand meter drill program that's you know soaking up everything and every every bit of capacity in and around Red Lake. So <laughs> that's what you have to do. Two hundred thousand meters was a lot. Unbelievable! Yeah. I know, crazy, isn't it? All uh, right, um, Keith has asked a question: If there are no roads in. Uh, what would be needed if the results are positive and how do you, how do you get, uh, get the, the product to market, which is, which is always less of an issue with gold. Cause the answer is, you know, you put it on a plane or a helicopter and, uh, and you get Your paid them. Yeah. You, you get paid the moment that, uh, that it hits that. So that's one of the beauties of the gold, gold industry. But I guess otherwise, you know, I, I think, uh, uh, it's just that logistical advantage of being right on tidewater where, you know, it doesn't matter if you're moving groceries or a bulldozer in, you know, you can put it on a barge and get it there. Uh, 100%. I, for me, the road's not, um, well, A, it's, it, it, you, they ran it for 10 years without a road. So yeah, it's exactly. doable. And they ran it, you know, uh, at $300 gold. Uh, for a lot of that time. Now, um, for me, the biggest thing, the biggest advantage to that road is safety. Um, yeah. You know, if there's a, an injury at site, um, you know, something something happens and you need to get someone out quickly and it's foggy or windy, uh, that's the challenge. And and yeah. I think that's the biggest benefit to it is a, is a safety perspective. Yeah, fair enough. And I'm sure that's uh, that's an argument that can resonate pretty well with regulators as uh as activity ramps up on the site too and you're starting to demonstrate progress on a development path yeah uh okay Dwayne has asked a question uh is the royalty of one dollars per ton paid to the newfoundland government or an asset that you can recoup at a later date um and the, the answer to that is no the, the one dollar a ton on the aggregate would be payable from big ridge to first mining um and uh, yeah, no, the, the, the aggregate, we, we touched on it a little bit, but we'd, we'd done quite a bit of work in understanding that. Originally, um, looking at what percentage of waste rock in an open pit that you could sell for aggregate, because there is this uh, geologic unit, the, the mineralization kind of occurs often on the contact of this Chetwin granite, which is a beautiful, beautiful uh, and massive uh, granite unit where you talked about the half a billion to a billion tons uh, preliminary resource, um, you know, it would be a real kind of premium aggregate product. Um, and we know that it holds up pretty well because that airstrip that you're talking about uh, is basically covered in this crushed Chetwin granite. And it's been bashed by the wreck house winds for 30 years and still looks like it was put down yesterday right like it's uh, it's amazing it's obviously good good stuff 
Um, so yeah, it was something that, uh, that we'd done a bit of work on and said, you know, somewhere down the track, the, the reality is they're getting aggregate in the United States from a long way away. And you get to learn a little bit about the aggregate business, which is sometimes foreign to, you know, metal miners. Um, but it's a cost and logistics exercise. And, um, you know, you, you make a lot of money by selling a lot of rock at, at small margin and really controlling your cost. But the advantage of electricity and tidewater, as soon as you get that product on a boat, it doesn't matter, you know, if it's if it's on a boat in Mexico or it's on a boat on the south coast of Newfoundland, it costs about the same to get it to New York Harbor where there's just no aggregate left on the U.S. East, East Coast, right? So the economics of that are something like uh what you can put on a ship you know for a thousand kilometers uh compares with trucking for like 20 or 30 like it's it's some ridiculous number like that 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 um uh one of the consultants who who we'd had do a lot of work kind of gave us some real education on it so yeah i don't know it's uh i think it's a it's a long-term optionality um but it, it is something that i think has real strategic value going forward and particularly when you're when you're leveraging the infrastructure that's already there or the infrastructure you need to build to ramp up into a production scenario in a mine um yeah could be interesting and there's uh, there is an inferior product being shipped um from the north side of the island down to the eastern seaboard and it's two days extra shipping yeah so it's it, we've we've had discussions with that group already. Um, you know, they're pretty excited. Yeah, no, absolutely, and they're uh, and they're and they're making decent money at it. And I think that's it's only going to get it's only going to get better as you kind of you know get into the real guts of the infrastructure spend that they're talking about in the U.S. So um, we'll we'll see what impending recession does to all of that. But uh, it's probably only a a, a change in the change in the slope maybe a little bit of the line of the of the growth but you know they're they're going to need the material um here we see ken asks another question uh since the shareholders uh want to see the fruits of the investments uh you know can you talk a little bit about the urgency in developing the project and how how fast can you progress, you know, I'll, I'll ask the question a slightly different way. Um, if, if capital wasn't a constraint, are there things that you could be doing to advance the project more quickly? Um, yeah, 100%. I mean, if capital wasn't uh, an issue, then um, uh, I, I'd have a, probably have a drill program more comparable to, um, say, Newfound Gold. <laughs> um and uh you know we we'd already have engineers on our team um starting to think about how we're going to um you know how we're going to mine it and uh you know i i would yeah i'd love to be if we if that were the issue and yeah we'd be we'd be working through that right now and um and, and thinking about putting a, a mine back into production and um you know keeping drill rigs uh, on the property turning as well um you know the the timeline to to put it into production if that were the case i mean um it's it's all it's all about the permitting i think um to definitively answer that question uh we'll see when marathon gets their permit because uh it's going to speak volumes for for the island and um and, and putting a gold project into production especially an open pit one right that's yeah. uh, it's going to do plus two hundred thousand ounces a year it's a big project so um uh, when they when they get their permits, um, we'll we'll be able to to definitively answer that. But I think you know they've been at it for a year, right? Uh, maybe maybe a bit longer now. So. Yeah, it's uh, you know I I actually recall we went to what you know as an aside was the most fun mining conference I've ever been to in my life, which was the Western Newfoundland Mining Conference in Bayvert, Newfoundland. Uh, in 2019, we went to, to visit Hope Brook and it was a great chance. I mean, it's only at, at the Western Newfoundland Mining Conference that like everyone meets the premier because the premier comes and, you know, 
is around while everyone's having a few drinks and you know in the in the hockey rink in Bay Vert they set up like a you know a black tie dinner like it was it was amazing the foreigners got screeched in it was a full <laughs> full dose of Newfoundland hospitality um but it it is that uh at at that conference this was 2019 you know i think uh they were in advanced stages of permitting they maybe hadn't submitted the ea uh we're getting to know a lot about the timing and you know how ea processes move forward here with spring pole for sure uh and making good progress on it but um yeah i, I think getting that across the finish line and into construction um raises some pretty interesting opportunities for what can happen if we're able to advance hope brook reasonably quickly to you know mineral resource and at least a snapshot of a development scenario make sure that you're collecting all that long lead time environmental data um and be in a position to move it more quickly because you know it's not that far away it's a sizable resource already and uh you know there are two or three projects totaling you know four or five million ounces of gold in in the neighborhood so at some point you know it may it may make sense for some of that bigger picture consolidation to to take place as well cuz cuz matador would be how far like 30k yeah and um you, you know i you know we haven't even it's not like we've had discussions or anything but back to the whole barging thing you know do you need two mills um yeah ah. Does you know? Is there is there something there that makes sense in the future? Because uh, yeah, they're not. They're certainly not far. Yeah, no, for sure. And uh, and you know, I think when you when you do the compare and contrast, if you could have a port facility to be able to get all your stuff in and out, versus you know having to go the long the long way where roads don't exist in some pretty tough terrain, um, the the logistical advantages of uh, of Hope Brook are pretty significant here. All right. Uh, here comes a question that I'm sure you are asked all the time. You made an allusion earlier, but uh, how much cash does Big Ridge have on the balance sheet and how long will that last? Yeah, I touched on it. We've, uh, we're have we about four and a half million dollars um, at the end of the quarter. And then we've got uh, over a million in marketable securities. Um, it gets us, you know, well through our, our drill program. Um, as far as how long does it last, I said just um, that will depend on our plans for, um, you know, post the drill program. Um, do we keep two rigs on site? Um, do we step back and uh, focus on the resource and the PEA and maybe get a, a more nimble Duralite or something on site and start testing regionally? We haven't defined our program yet, but those are some of the thoughts that are going through our head right now. Um, and what's going to be um, the most palatable um, for the market. Um, and, and, um, and like I said, that's, uh, we'll be figuring that out in the, in the next month or so, and, uh, and we'll update the market when we, um, when we make that decision. Uh, and talk, talk a little bit about how the shareholder base has built out over the last, uh, over the last year. Um, yeah, because I think, I think you've, you know, you've obviously, uh, done good work to continue to build that and uh, and brought in a strategic investor so when we rolled the stock back um we made the name change and, and did the raise um you know we were we were we, we were so we had 22 million shares roughly uh 11 were uh, alto shareholders uh all retail uh there were there you know there was a um, a couple decent sized um, uh, shareholders, but you know nothing um, by way of big institution. Um, and then the other eleven, the other fifty percent of the stock was um, Endeavor Resources um, shareholders, which by and large was the same thing. It was retail. They had they had done one, um, I think four million dollar raise. Um, and, um, you know, looking at the warrant holders, um, it was, it was broad, uh, let's put it, that <laughs> way. it was retail. Um, so we, you know, we essentially doubled the, the, um, uh, the share count with our, um, 
on our rollback and with our $2.2 million raise. That was done. So um, that raise was done literally with friends and family out of Toronto, um, people in the industry that I had worked with. Uh, so that's, you know, 22 plus they've already accelerated their warrant last summer. So they've got about 44 million shares, um, you know, and I'm not um, delusional. Some of them have certainly sold their stock. But um, uh, just to give you a way, looking at our Nobo list, uh, we've got 60 percent of our shareholders on our Nobo list, which I think. Oh, is wow. Really high. Yeah. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, from uh 2020 to 2021 um a lot of those actually increased their share share uh holdings so it's fantastic um on uh and then uh, so post that what's that take us it's around 45 million shares or so and then we did um a raise last year um at uh 20 cents that um brought in mike gentilly who um is a you know on a partially dilute basis is 19.9 uh, and then the 11 and a half to, to first mining. So we're at 108 million now, um, you know, with the accelerated warrant with the raise, uh, and the, the shares to, to first mining. So, um, first mining and, uh, and Mike are our biggest shareholders. And then institutionally, um, we actually have, um, about uh, 10 to 12 institutions in the name, nothing massive, but um, some good names that um, I think, um, or I really hope in the future, they're there for, um, you know, to participate and support us um, on, on, a, on, a bigger, uh, on a bigger scale. No, that's great. That's it's a lot of work from you know from the original kind of rollback and the and the cleanup. All of that that all happened prior to announcement of the Hope Brook deal, right? That was, I want to say, late 2020, early 2021 that you did that? That's uh, exactly, yeah, it was actually mid-2020. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, July 7th, we uh, we announced the, um, uh, of 2020, we announced the closing, uh, which was a sub-receipt on that raise. That was to close the uh, the uh, business combination with ours. Right, right, right. Um, okay, well, listen, we're, uh, we're winding down on time here. Why don't we just uh, hit it with the key catalysts in the next six months? What does everyone have to look out for? And, uh, and we'll let everyone get on with their day. Okay, so starting, um, you know, probably next week, you'll start to see us uh, with consistent drill results. I mean, we've already got out two batches, but uh, they're going to start to come regularly. Um, I think we'll, uh, we'll probably hit our stage one earn in before the end of the year. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, big catalysts will be, uh, I think that resource estimate update, uh, to obviously include the copper as well. And then, um, um, we'll, uh, we'll get going on, um, an economic study, uh, post that resource estimate. And before that, obviously we're, we'll probably press release, uh, who we've engaged in, in a, in a bit of a timeline, uh, for everyone so they can keep their eye on it. Lots going on in the next six months. It's exciting times. Hopefully, a couple of those drill holes come back, particularly on the on on where you're testing some of these new zones. I think it has potential to really change the perception of what's there. Right from, you know, it's one of the reasons that we that that first mining kind of brought in a partner and and you guys specifically was that real conviction uh, as to the ability to grow this deposit into something that's new. Um, and it's not going to take much. It's not going to take much to really, you know, move this. You're already sitting with a million ounce resource. Move this. Uh, move this into kind of another tier of of development scale. So it's pretty exciting stuff. Oh, absolutely. Awesome, Mike. Uh, thanks for joining us today. I think uh, hopefully this sheds a, a little bit of light on uh, on one of the great hidden values in, inside first mining. Because you got to remember, we even well, right now we own one hundred percent of this project. We aspire that we're going to own twenty percent of the project, which is carried to a feasibility study. That interest, even after you spend the the twenty. Uh, and we have the royalties on on the project and on the aggregate, and we're the second largest shareholder of the company. So we're all obviously rooting for your success um, and uh, cheering as loud as we can from the sidelines. But uh, appreciate you joining us today and and giving people a little more uh, a little more detail on uh, on the great work that you guys are doing. 
No, thanks for having me. It was great. And uh, if any shareholders have any questions, uh, my name and email are on the website. I'd be happy to help. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. And uh, again, you know where to where to reach us if you have any questions or follow up that we can help direct to Mike as well. But thanks very much all. And uh, we'll be back in another few weeks uh, talking about the next element of the hidden value series here at First Mining. Lots of good stuff to come. So thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.